الله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين. All praise due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. وكذلك جعلناكم أمة وسطا لتكونوا شهداء على الناس ويكون الرسول عليكم شهيدا. Thus I have made you a justly balanced nation to be witnesses for the nations and the messenger a witness for you. This verse identifies one of the unique characteristics of Islam. In that all religions call to good. They encourage people to avoid evil. There are, there are basically a common, there's a common thread which they all share. However, when you look into the various religions, you will see imbalance. Imbalance in one way or another. And it is only Islam that maintains that balance, justice, not going to one extreme or to another. Islam has this unique characteristic. And this is fundamentally what Islam has to offer the world today. Because we have no technology. There was a time in the past when people came from all over the world to our centers of learning to gain knowledge of literature, reading, writing, sciences, etc architecture, hydrology, all kinds of areas of learning. But that time has passed. And today, that knowledge which we held has passed out of our hands into the hands of others. Now we are the ones going to their centers of learning to learn from them. That is the reality in which we live today. However, though we may be behind in technology, we remain the leaders in morality. This is the unique element, the factor which keeps us balanced. Islam being, as the Prophet ﷺ stated, a moral message. All of the teachings of Islam can be summarized in its morality. When he said, I was sent only to you in order to identify for you to bring to you the highest of moral character traits, morality. It is that morality which provides the, mor the, the compass, the moral compass for civilization. And it is found throughout its teachings. Islam 
encourages us on all of the levels in which we live not to go to extremes. Whether it is with regards to our relationship with Allah or our relationship with other human beings or with the world in which we live, the environment, the world in which we live. So there are moral messages which address, well, today our civilization is dominated by Western civilization and its values. Those values are focused in materialism. We educate ourselves in order for us to benefit in the dunya. To get as much wealth as we can amass. That becomes the driving force. And we utilize that wealth in extravagant ways. We waste so much of that wealth. So Allah warns us in the Quran. Inna al-mubadhirina kanu ikhwan al-shayateen wa kana al-shaytanu li-rabbihi kafura. Indeed, those who are extravagant are brethren of the devils. And the devil was a disbeliever in his own. So we are encouraged to avoid the excesses connected with the material world, how we use it. He gave us all kinds of uh, pointers in terms of how we build our homes, our buildings, our masjids, etc. He warned us away from extravagance, decorating buildings decorating masters. Of course, we have gone way away from those guidelines. So masters now are filled with all kinds of decorations. You come into the masjid, you're looking at all of these things, the writings on the wall and the carvings and the this. And... It's art. You say it's art. But this is not the masjid that the Prophet encouraged us to build. He used to get rid of clothing which had lines and things on it so whilst he was making salah, it caught his eye. So he got rid of it. Because he didn't want to be distracted in salah. But the way we are building our buildings now, so many distractions and this extravagance, it's cost. Well, the kind of money people spend on a dome the cost of the dome and the minaret. Minaret, huge minaret. Okay, there was a time when we needed that minaret to carry the voice of the Mu'addin. Now we have uh, PA systems. You can sit with just a pole and a speaker and do the same thing. You don't need all of that. But we still spend huge amounts of money the building of masters, wasting money. In the entrance, beautiful, we love the designs and all these kinds of things, but really it is not in keeping with the spirit of Islam. That spirit of moderation. We use that wealth well. How can we have people starving in our society and then we're building these huge edifices? This is a challenge, challenge of our time. We can find extremes and uh, we could say imbalance in our entertainment today, how we entertain ourselves. One of the popular ways of entertainment when you go to uh, amusement parks and this kind of things I like roller coasters. These uh, 
things that you sit on, rockets that shoot you up into the air, twisting and spinning. Your heart is in your throat. But it's like a thrill. You, you know, you like that. But is this really what Islam encourages? Because each time you go in that machine, you know somewhere around the world one of those machines breaks and somebody falls out and dies. Bungee jumping. People jump off bridges with big rubber bands tied to their feet. Every time, somewhere in the air, somewhere in the world, one of those rubber bands breaks. And that person jumps off, hits the ground, that's the end of it. Even parachuting, people, entertainment, the thrill of getting out there, jumping out that plane. Okay, war, where you need to get troops in a certain place at a certain time, you have people trained and all this. But just for the thrill of it, jumping out there, I can't. This is not, this is excess. Because of course, sometimes somebody pulls that rip cord and no parachute comes out. They pull number two, also number two wasn't packed properly, and they hit the ground, and that's all we heard about them. So these forms of entertainment, these are excess. We're going to excess, putting ourselves in harm, harm's way. And Allah warns us about it in the Quran, saying, Don't throw yourselves into destruction with your own hands. Hobbies, mountain climbing. Every year people are climbing up Mount Everest. And of course, from the Arab world, from the Muslim world, you know, the first few that got up there, they put their flag and you know, yay, Muslims finally climbed to the top of Mount Everest. So what? What is the point? You know, how many people die in that climb every year? Imagine climbing up there, that avalanche hits you, and you wake up on the Day of Judgment standing before Allah. What are you going to say? So these kind of excesses, Islam says, you know, your life has more value than that. It's not about just the thrill of riding a roller coaster or climbing a mountain. So, the issue of excesses exists in all areas of our lives. It exists also in the weddings, the walimas, the aqiqas. People spend huge amounts of money on weddings, taking it into five-star hotels and all kinds of money, food wasted, thrown. These are hateful in the sight of Allah. They're hateful. It's excess. That's excess in the dunya. And Allah describes the believers saying, Those who are neither extravagant nor miserly when they spend, but instead they're firmly between those extremes. So we neither hold money that we should spend to help people, nor do we waste money by throwing it away. We're, we're, neither, we're neither of those extremes, finding that middle point. However, the extreme imbalance in religion is even more serious because religion is the most important thing in our lives. So when we go off, when we go to extremes in religion, this is the most dangerous area that we should we could be uh, in excess. Allah tells us in the Quran, addressing 
the people of the book, but addressing them for us to reflect. He said, قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ لَا تَغْلُوا فِي دِينِكُمْ غَيْرَ الْحَقِّ Say, O people of the scripture, do not exceed the bounds of what is proper in your religion by believing in falsehood. الْغُلُوا فِي الدِّينِ Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warned us إِيَّاكُمْ وَالْغُلُوا فِي الدِّينِ Beware of excessiveness in religion, for surely those before you perished due to excessiveness in religion. And that excess may enter into issues of aqidah, how we conceive Allah and human beings, where Prophet Muhammad had warned us about not taking our love for him, which is part of our faith, our love for him to excess. Excess like what the Christians did before. He said, La tutruni kama atratat al Nasara ibn Maryam. Fa inna ma ana abduhu fa kulu abdullahi wa rasulu. Do not exaggerate in praising me as the Christians did to the son of Mary. For I'm only a slave, so call me instead the slave of Allah and his messenger. Instead, we have gone to extremes. Instead of maintaining that humility, that humbleness, that, that balance that the Prophet displayed in such statements or that Allah identified in the Quran itself telling him to say Qul innama ana basharun mithlukum yuha ilayya annama ilahukum ilahum muhi say I'm only a human being like you the only difference is that it has been revealed to me revelation came to me concerning the oneness of Allah, that Allah is only a unique one. As the Christians went to extremes and ended up making Prophet Isa God, the Son of God, who is God, worshipped as God, whose mother is called the Mother of God, worshipped also we find Muslims reaching a stage quite similar and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had warned us that we should not follow the way of the people before us hand span by hand span arms length by arms length until we enter into a Lizard's hole following them. He warned us that it's going to happen. And sure enough, we are doing as they do. So Prophet Muhammad وسلم, has been elevated. There are those who claim that he was created from the light of Allah. They call it Nuri Muhammad. The Mohammedan light. So what are they saying? He is from Allah's light. He is divine. He walked this earth, but they say he didn't have a shadow. There's a book produced in Pakistan called The Shadowless Prophet. I remember reading that book, The Shadowless Prophet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, when the Prophet Sallallahu walked with his companions, everybody had a shadow except him. We know there's some narrations of a cloud uh, providing shade for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the difference between saying, okay, miraculously a cloud came, 
and provided shade for him, and saying he had no shadow. You know, that is putting him in another realm altogether. Like the vampires. Something, some other kind of world. They have no image when they look into the mirror of the room, they can't see themselves. So they put Prophet Muhammad in another world, another dimension. He didn't die. It's just a whole set of people in India and Pakistan who believe that the Prophet is alive in his grave. And that if you said the Prophet died, you are a disbeliever. How extreme can you get? So what are they saying? When Omar ibn al-Khattab, when the Prophet ﷺ had died, Omar ibn al-Khattab had gone, actually he realized the Prophet ﷺ was dead, but the, the, you know, the, the, he was overwhelmed by the death of the Prophet ﷺ, so much so that he went out and in his state of being overwhelmed by that incident, he took out his sword and said, whoever said the Prophet is dead or has died, I will take his head off. People stopped. Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, came, went past Omar, went in, checked the Prophet lift up the garment that was covering him, kissed his forehead, came back out, pushed Omar aside and said, those people who were worshipping Muhammad know that Muhammad is dead. And those who are worshipping the Lord of Muhammad, the God of Muhammad, know that he is everything. That is the balance. Omar went off there. He became imbalanced. I mean, it can happen. It's just such a shock. But Abu Bakr brought things back into place. So this idea that the Prophet ﷺ didn't die, this is extreme. Furthermore, the Sahaba prayed Salatul Janazah for him. So we said, what were they doing? If the Prophet ﷺ was alive, what were they praying Salatul Janazah for? We pray Salatul Janazah for who? The dead. <laughs> Not for the living. Although sometimes some people do that for the living. One um, Jewish friend of mine who, in the UK who converted to Islam, when he called up his family, they told them, we have prayed Salatul Janazah for you. Don't call us again. <laughs> so it does happen. But as a general state of mind and belief, this is an extreme. An extreme in religion which leads then people to worship Prophet Muhammad. So people will call on him in worship. But the Islam, the religion of Islam, it actually calls to the opposite. To following Muhammad وسلم, as a way of worshipping Allah by following him, by obeying him. That's what is required of us. As Allah told us, in Kuntum Tuhibun Allah, Fatabihuni, Allah. If it is that you want the love of Allah, that's what you seek, then follow Muhammad وسلم, and Allah will love you. It's about following him not worshipping him. And the religion, in all of its teachings, one of the basic principles in the Sharia concerning the rites and rituals of the religion that, we are, that have been prescribed for us, is ease. Ease has been put into everything. So when something is difficult, an easy version is there to keep things balanced. Tayammu when we have no water, or water is harmful to us. 
Fasting. You can break your fast when you're traveling. So long. When you're a traveler, it's shortened. All of this is ease in the religion. And we are called to take the religion easy. So much so that on one occasion, when Prophet Muhammad was in the masjid with the Sahaba, a Bedouin came in, went into a corner of the masjid and started to urinate. The Sahaba immediately jumped up when we're ready to pounce on the man, you know, and throw him out of the masjid. Prophet said, stop. Let him finish. Then get some water and pour it. Where are you connected? And then he said, make things easy. Don't make it difficult. Yes, sir, or not yes. This is a principle. Using our intelligence, finding the best way, using wisdom. Not blindly following rituals whose purpose we don't understand, but we do simply because our parents and our grandparents and great grandparents did it. So, even something so precious as the Quran itself, we turn into extremes. The memorization of the Quran today, and of course, memorization of the Quran is a good thing. But when people go to extremes, where the memorization of the whole Quran becomes the goal, why? Because it has been said that one who memorizes the Quran, he can take in so many members of their family into paradise along with them. So what do people do in families? They designate one child. Okay, you are going to memorize Quran for us. <laughs> you will be the one to take us all into paradise. That's your job. You memorize the whole of Quran. And the way in which Quran is memorized in much of the Muslim world today is with a big stick. <laughs> so that child is beaten until he or she memorizes the whole Quran. But these are excesses. They are excesses. So much so that if we compare in the time of Prophet Muhammad how many people had memorized the whole Quran when the Prophet ﷺ died? After more than 40,000 Sahaba making Hajj with him, how many out of all of those and more had memorized the whole Quran? It's going to say less than 10. Less than 10. So if the goal was simply memorizing the text, don't tell me only 10 Sahaba could do it. But they didn't learn the Quran that way. As Abdullah ibn Mas'ud told us, we used to learn the Quran 10 verses at a time. And we would not move on to another 10 until we understood what Allah was saying to us in that, that 10. And we try to implement it. We used to learn faith and deeds at the same time. So it was Quran to act on it. Because of that, then the Sahaba said, we used to call the one who memorized the whole of Surah Al-Baqarah Hafiz. Today, if you call a person who only memorized Surah Al-Baqarah two and a half Jews, half it, it was, what is that? I would have been that. You are degrading memorization of Quran. They think it's not good. But that's what the Sahaba did. They used to call the one who memorized Surah Al-Baqarah. Why? Because Surah Al-Baqarah encompasses 
all of the ideas of the Quran. It's all encompassed. So that was their approach. And that's why I tell people when they come to Ramadan, it's the same thing, excess again. We leave the Quran all year long until first of Ramadan. First of Ramadan, we take it down from the shelf, we blow off the dust, <laughs> take off the covers, we have some you know, places they got leather and cloth and take it all off, and we sit down with the Quran. And we read through the whole Quran in Ramadan, that's the goal. But I advise people, listen, it's better for you to just read Surah Al-Baqarah, if that's all you can get through. Read it with tafsir, reflecting on its meanings, is far better for you than just reading through the whole text of the Quran. You don't understand a word of what you're reading. But this is excess. We have gone to an excess into the ritual. So much so that we have turned the Quran, instead of focusing on the meaning of the Quran, we're focused on respecting the Quran. We have this new thing, respecting the Quran. How do you respect it? Before you start to read it, you take it, you kiss it. You know, you squeeze it on your head, then you open it up. If it falls from your hand, you better pick it up and kiss it. Don't put it on your lap. That's your aura. Somebody in the masjid stretches their foot. Oh, you're stretching your foot towards the masjid, the Quran. Please get your foot up. Don't, don't sit, sit with your foot stretched out. And the Quran's in the front of the masjid, they're stacked up. When you're walking out of the master, you better walk out backwards. Otherwise, you're turning your back on the Quran. Now the <laughs> These are all extremes. Extremes. On top of extremes. You know, focused on the ritual to the point where we're creating our own rituals. Rasulullah never told us all of this stuff. But we have created it. Because it's easier to focus on rituals than to focus on the essence of faith. The rituals, you don't have to think. It's just like a thing you do. You know it's automatic. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to make effort with it. So we've taken this easy route, but in the process, we have ended up off the path. On the other hand, we have, some of us will go to extremes in, in doing things of the religion, which are the actual things of the religion, but taking them to excesses on the other side. Doing too much instead of doing too little. And the Prophet of course, many hadiths, I'm sure you all heard them already, about the people who came and said they were gonna fast every day, they're gonna stay up in night, every night in prayer, they're not gonna get married, the Prophet said, don't do it. I fast, I break my fast. I stay up at night in prayer and I sleep. And I get married. So whoever doesn't like this sunnah of mine, this moderate sunnah of mine, then you're not a true follower of mine. For man rahira an sunnati, for they send me. So even in goodness, we can go to extremes. Also, when we consider even more recent events in the Muslim world, and we see in the news Boko Haram, ISIS, Abu Sayyaf. Maybe you haven't heard about Abu Sayyaf. They were in the Philippines chopping off tourists' heads and Americans. This is another set of extremes. Of course, what's all behind it? The powers that be, it is in their interest to create such groups, fuel such groups, promote such groups, in order to distort the image of Islam. And the more and more we see that, we think to ourselves, where are we headed? You know, it's like we're losing our way completely. Actually, it is a sign that Islam is on the rise. Because the stronger that Muslims 
awakened to Islam, the stronger that awakening is, the stronger the forces that seek to suppress it will act. So these are actually good signs, though they're not good in the sense that they distort the image of Islam, they hurt us in different ways, but in the overall sense, they are a sign that good is taking place. And no matter what they do, the evil turns to good, produces good, which they didn't plan. So we should beware of such groups. Be, they come up in all of our countries. One of the basic principles to keep in mind regarding them is the nature of their da'wah. If their da'wah is to, whenever you see da'wah which calls to hatred of Muslims, know that it is an evil da'wah. A da'wah which calls you to kill other Muslims, to slaughter other Muslims. Of course, you're going to declare them disbelievers first, and then you slaughter them. That kind of da'wah is an evil da'wah. Beware of it. And our only defense, ultimately, is to know Islam, to know what true Islam is. Because that is our protection. Without that knowledge, then it is an open season against us. Also, we have within our own ranks fanatical movements, madhabs, where people turn madhabs into different religions. The madhabs for about 700 years from the 12th century all the way up until the 20th century, the madhabs had become like different religions. So much so that around the Kaaba, when the time for Salah came, the Imam, who was a Shafi'i Imam, would stand under a structure which was built around the Kaaba called Maqam Shafi'i. And all the Shafi'is who were making tawaf would then line up behind him and pray. When he was finished, then the Hanafi Imam would stand under another structure called Maqam Hanafi. And Hanafis would pray behind him. And so also for Malikis and Fahmi. So we had four different prayers going on around the Kaaba. Is that Islam? Is that the Islam which was brought by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu no. That is madhab fanaticism. So much so that during that period, it was ruled by scholars of the Hanafi madhab that it was impermissible, haram, for a Hanafi to marry a Shafi'i. Something is unthinkable. Now you say, what? No, he's making it up. It's not true. Can't be. It is the truth. For hundreds of years. Eventually the ruling was overturned, but it stood for hundreds and hundreds of years. Hanafis could not marry Shafi'i. They could marry Christians. Because Allah said in the Quran, you know, you can marry the people of the book. They could marry Christians and Jews, and they couldn't marry a Shafi'i. This is extremism. This is a hulu fiddin, to reach that point. And it has its remnants amongst us, though maybe we don't see it as bad as that, but it still remains amongst us. We have, even amongst those who are awakening to Islam in our times, some who basically take the position that it's only our way and our scholars. 
if you don't do whatever we do and follow our scholars, then you're off. You said I'm following Quran and Sunnah. But because you, you follow the scholars that you're following are not ones who are agreed on by our scholars. Or maybe they never even said anything, but they're just different scholars. Automatically you're ruled as being off. This is fanaticism. And in organizations, Islamic organizations, we have Islamic organizations that end up into secret societies where they have secret meetings. They plot and they plan. You know, where the, the methodology is you get your little group together and then at a certain point you grab the leadership, kill them, take over. Set up. Islamic law. law. Sharia. But Allah tells us in the Quran, لا خير في كثير من نجواهم. Most of their secret meetings are evil. <coughs> Transparency. This is the Islamic way. We don't plot and plan. Unless Allah goes on to say you're trying to do a good thing that you don't want people to know about that you did it. Okay. Privately you can do that. That's the exception. Otherwise, the plotting and planning for movement for the most part, it brings evil with it. So, even in our general lives, people oftentimes ask, you know, when I come to the lecture, my iman is like, oh, I'm feeling good when I come out of the lecture. But, by the next day, I'm home playing with my kids and whatever else, my iman just be What happened? How do I keep my iman, iman up all the time? Well, you know, the Sahaba complained about the same thing. They said, oh, Messenger of Allah, when we're with you, our iman is like... But when we go home to our families, it's gone down. So what did the Prophet prescribe? Stay with me all the time? Give up your families? No, he said, time for this and time for that. That's the balance. Finding the balance. And this principle, as I mentioned, essentially has behind it that moral compass which Islam offers to human civilization. So we maintain what is evil <coughs> remains evil. We don't change it with time and how people feel. <coughs> if it was evil, prescribed as evil by Allah, who created human beings, then it can never be good. Once you turn it into good, you have gone to the extreme. Excesses. So for example, one of the major excesses coming out of Western civilization today is what? Homosexuality. That we should accept homosexuality as an alternative way of life, same as us, no difference. And it's pumped into the schools. In Canada, Two years ago, they passed what was called Bill 13, in which it now became law that homosexuality would be taught from kindergarten in the schools of Canada. From kindergarten. What can you expect 15 years from now when that generation comes out? It's, we have bad things happening right now. Of course, Canada was the first to have, you know, same-sex marriages, right? And now in America, it's 22 states already, and it's just a tsunami hitting the rest of America. It's just a matter of time, and it just becomes a norm. Nobody questions it, except an extremist. That's us. <laughs> so, 
Islam, we provide that compass. We will never change that. We will never accept a homosexual imam who openly says, I'm a homosexual, pray behind me. It's not to say you cannot be a homosexual and a Muslim. Right? That could be. We don't say simply because he's a homosexual, he's not a Muslim anymore. No. It's a sin, like a Muslim who fornicated. It doesn't make him a non-Muslim. Who murders, doesn't make him a non-Muslim. But for him to announce, I'm a homosexual, this is a homosexual masjid, we have that now in America. Have it in Toronto also. Homosexual masjids. Of course, usually it's not built up. Right now they're praying in, you know, churches. They'll give them a spot. But they declared it homosexual masjid. Time will come when they will build one. It's just a matter of time. Not in the Muslim world, but in that world, yes. It will be supported and promoted. So this is the challenge that faces us. To maintain that balance, maintain that middle position, not going to one extreme or the other. There are many people around the world who respect that position if we stay firm, we are open about our positions. This in itself is da'wah. For people who think, people who reflect, it becomes da'wah to them, invitation to Islam. And because of that, as Allah said in the very beginning, and we said, quoting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we would be the witnesses against humankind. We are the ones upholding this moral compass. And the rest of humankind have gone astray. We will be that witness on the Day of Judgment. By us standing firm, people who have, who remain on the fitra, they will have an option. <coughs> yes, there is another way. This makes more sense. We will remain until the last day, and the Prophet ﷺ is the witness against us, that he told us. Didn't I convey the message to you? Yes, we received it. So, this lecture talks about maintaining the balance with Islam as a whole. We need to take these general principles and make it real in our personal lives. Finding the balance. So as a father, there's a balance that you have to find. As a husband, there's a balance. As a wife, there's a balance. As children, there are balances. We need to find and maintain the balance. As long as we maintain that balance, then the family and it's the teachings of Islam which guide us to understand understanding that balance. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to find that balance in our lives and to keep us on Sirat al Mustaqeem because that is the balanced path and to give us success with paradise at the end of this life. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Abu Amina, Dr. Bilal Phillips for this excellent presentation. And I'd like to call upon our Sheikh Walid, Abdul Hakim, to have a seat on the podium. Now we are coming to the interesting uh, question and answer session. We have 15 minutes for question and answers. Uh, we have mics available, one for the sisters, one for the brothers. I will prefer that you raise your hand and address the question to whom you want to address so they can answer from there. Okay, uh, the brothers who have the mic. Okay, who, who is, there's a question right yeah, here yeah, in the front. Would we'll give chance first for the brothers and go by turns, inshallah.
please uh, be specific to the topic in question. Uh, we want the questions to be relevant for the benefit of everybody. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bilal. There's a question uh, for you. The main focus of your lecture was this Surat uh, Bakka, Ayat number 143. Now, the verse before and after this ayat is this change of Qibla. Salipul Subha, and after that is Karna Raza Kallava. So, could you please tell us the relevance? Because every ayat, the order of each ayat is from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So, why this ayat of Qibla, change of Qibla is just before and after this ayat? Is, there has to be some specific reason for this. I hope I am able to make myself understand. Yeah, you are entering into the area of philosophy, uh, philosophizing about the links between the verses, Allah has put it there, um, the balance and the issue of the balance with regards to changing of Qibla, that is a part of the faith. Those who would reject the change would be those who went to excesses, who didn't maintain the balance. The balance was that which was set by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the issue of the balance is found throughout the Quran. The fact that it was placed in this verse in particular, I have not reflected and researched to see what all the scholars have said on it. But the essential message is clear from the verse. And whatever you see in the Quran, it will reflect in one way or another this balance which Allah speaks about in that verse. Next question, we'll give chance, brother, to others. We'll come, if there is chance, time, we'll give. Let's see the others. Any question from the sister's side? Yes, there's one sister over there, please. Assalamu alaikum. I'm very pleased to ask a question. Thank you. Um, my question is, who, um, who do you think can stop fanaticism? Are you or addressing? how we can stop fanaticism? Oh. We are the ones who have to stop it. We have to stop it by establishing uh, educational institutions that will raise our children properly guided. Uh, in the educational system, which we are functioning in right now, the, it, there is imbalance. Islam in our Islamic schools is in one corner and all of the other subjects are in another corner. This is an unbalanced and imbalanced circumstance. The Islamic way is full integration. So whatever the student is learning in school, whether it's science, math, English, whatever, Islam has a, a place within it. So when we give them this holistic view, of knowledge and education as they're learning, then this will give them that rounded view which will understand, which will understand Islam as a way of life, uh, a guide for us in all aspects of our lives. And of course, in the schools, you would need to have trained scholars, people who are properly trained, who are going to be teaching and not just you know anybody from off the, you know, the block off the street, you bring them in, okay, uh, you got a long beard, so please teach. Right? Uh, basically, I was talking about uh, stopping fanaticism from the uh, from the side where it is now. I mean, at schools, in ourselves in the families, we know where to Islam, so we try to know where to Islam is. But how about the uh, Islam which is already radicalized and fantasized? Uh, who will stop them because because of those acts of radicalism we are labeled now, right? We're not agreeing with that, but at the same time, it looks like the whole world is silent about it. I mean, from our side, from the Muslim side. No, actually, we're, we're not silent, but what happens is that our voices are not heard. Oh, you know, the media heard. selectively will 
promote the other issues and then when our scholars speak and many have spoken and written etc but they downplay it they'll put it in the back page you know so this is just a media uh, you know exploitation thank you sister uh, yes the brothers in the back rows okay the one who is one question at a time Uh, uh, my question is for uh, Sheikh Walid, I think. Uh, you spoke about uh, time management and how we should uh, have a balance in our time and stuff. Uh, is there any research on uh, how many hours did the Prophet sleep or what's the best time of sleeping? Because whenever I come to science it says that you need to sleep like 8 hours or 7 hours a day if you don't do brain <laughs> something like that. And, what we do we have like uh, specific that you know if we sleep this much as most like don't sleep eight hours sleep five hours <laughs> it's like okay for your question so the question is about uh the lecture of the time management specifically about the sleeping of the prophet <laughs> is there any specifics about how many number of hours the Prophet ﷺ slept because as you know today when we look at science for example it tells us you know the healthy thing is from 6 to 8 uh, that was the old research the new research says there is no specific number of hours it, it just you have to go through the four cycles of sleeping and then you even now have apps in your phone which is measure uh, measure your cycles of sleeping they can measure how much you're moving in your bed you know, and then wake you up at the at the fourth cycle, the correct time. So that's the research. But when we look at the Prophet Sallallahu we will see that, for example, in the hadith uh, that he narrated uh, by Abdullah ibn Amr al As, radiyallahu anhuma. So the Prophet Sallallahu has put the specifics for him. When, for example, one of the things he used to do is he used to do qiyam all night. So then the Prophet Sallallahu told him to do what? to do Qiyam just one third of the night. And he said, no, I could do more than that for Prophet of Allah. And then he said to him, do half of the night. And he said, I could do more than that. And then he said, do two thirds of the night, but do not do more than that. Okay? Except, of course, except exceptional times like Ramadan or something. But normally the person, so that means the person should sleep between one third and two thirds of the night. Okay? But if we take the minimum, or, or sorry, the maximum. So the number would be two thirds of the night. Of course, that changes from winter to summer. Okay? So the Sunnah does not specify a number of hours that the Prophet ﷺ has slept. Allah Alam. But you can always read about the habits of the Prophet ﷺ in terms of how he slept. Like, for example, what did he do before he slept? What did he do when he wake up? Okay. In the books of al shamat the books that talk about the characteristics of the Prophet Sallallahu and tells us about his life. But people, normally humans, have different needs depending on how much energy they're using in the day and how they're using it. So there is no magic number if that's what we're looking for, inshallah. But in general, it's not, it's not good for someone to go in the excessive in their sleeping time. Okay. And that, as we said, it differs from person to person. Even the modern research doesn't say six to eight anymore. It says whatever is enough for you to go the, through the four cycles of sleeping. Wallah uh, ta'ala. Any question from the sister's side? Yes, one sister. Uh, let me just also add that the Prophet the memory is to sleep in the day. So, it's, so when you're looking at his total sleeping hours, you have to include both what's happening at night and what he slept in the day. So he, 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 the fact is that the total hours will include both. Second one. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Uh, in Islam, in any way, is it permissible to celebrate birthdays or anniversaries or wish others on their birthdays and anniversaries? This is part of the excess, you know, where Prophet wanted is following practices of the people who came before. He already told us that we just have two annual celebrations, Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Abha, that's it. 
which repeats itself every year on that day, we only have two. After that, uh, it's, it was prohibited by the Prophet The Birthdays falls into that category of annual celebrations, and Eid, they call it uh, Eid al Milad. Uh, this is not permissible uh, because it goes against the instruction of the Prophet and also when you look at the roots of it, where it came from, it came from pagan beliefs and practices. Because if you look in the history even of Christianity, Judaism, Jews don't celebrate their birthdays. I mean, modern Jews might, but the traditional Jewish practice was against celebration of birthdays. If you even look into the Bible, Old and New Testaments, the only people who celebrated the birthdays were the pagans. Herod, uh, uh, what's his name, um, the, the Pharaoh. These are the people who celebrated their birthdays. And that's why the celebration even of Jesus' supposed birth didn't come until <coughs> 300 years after you know, Allah took him up. They believe he died. It was 300 years after. And similarly, the celebration of the Prophet Muhammad's birthday was some 400 years after, in the Fatimid period uh, in which the, uh, in Egypt, this is where it started. So when you're dealing with the issue of birthday, in fact, Allah SWT hid the birthday of Jesus as he hid the birthday of Prophet Muhammad The exact date of his birth is unknown. Though yes, 12th will be an hour and all this is known, but it is when you go back to the historians and you check, factually speaking, there is no evidence to establish it. In fact, the great historians of the past, they had many different days, all the way into, you know, Raja, but other months even. So it is unknown the date actually in, on which the Prophet Sallallahu was born. We know he was born on a Monday because he said no, he Other than that, we don't know. Similarly, Prophet Isa, it's known he was born, but what day he was born on, we have no idea. Exactly. Uh, brothers, anybody has a question? Yes, there's one question. <coughs> I have a question to uh, Sheikh Khalid. Uh, is there any restriction uh, sleeping between Salat, Salat al Fajr and Zohar and Zohar to Asr, Asr to Maghrib? Because nowadays office timings are like this. Sometimes you reach at home, you say Salat al Asr and then you sleep till Maghrib. So is there any restriction to sleep? Because I have heard people say don't sleep between Asr and Maghrib, Maghrib and Isha. Please explain. Um, originally, as we said, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the day and night cycle, and He told us about it in the Quran, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the night second. He made that the time where the person would rest, which is the time that rests, and the morning time, or the daytime, is the time when the person is awake. And you will see subhanAllah in the countries where this cycle is broken. Like for example, when I went to Tromsø, the extreme north of Norway in the Arctic Circle, in the summer, they don't have a night. In the summer, you see the sun would be circling in the sky without ever setting. SubhanAllah, like all day light. And then in the winter, I was actually there 10 days before it happened. By November 21, the sun will have the last ghurub, the last madrib. After that, the sun will not come out until the middle of February. So we're talking about almost three months, the sun will be completely disappearing. And because of that, they have psychological problems. SubhanAllah, you will find that they go more to psychological clinics than many other parts of the world, mainly because of that. And they have even developed, subhanAllah, they developed some special types of beds that when you go inside of it, you lock it as if you're locking yourself in a box so that you're able to sleep 
and rest properly in summer. Because even if you study, your cells are synchronized. What time of the day they are active and what time they are inactive are synchronized with the day and night cycle. So when we look in Islamic teachings, the time we go to sleep after Isha, when the darkness starts, until Fajr time or close before that. But we're talking about the night time in general. Sleeping in the daytime is the exception. And the Prophet ﷺ did it, as we said, the Sunnah is to do it between Buhur and Asr, the Qaylula time. And we said even by research, that gives you extra energy. If you just do 45 minutes at that time. But there is a karaha, it is makruh, it is dislike, not halal, but dislike to sleep from after Asr until Maghrib time. If someone is tired, they can do it, but it should not become a habit. If you develop a habit, we try to do it the way the Prophet ﷺ taught us, and this is not just because of the teaching of Islam, this is for your own good. This is what? Uh, the way that Allah subhanahu wa created the day and the night. Jazakumullah. Can I take one more question for, from the sisters? Okay. Let me also just add that the issue of sleeping after Asr, I mean, why would it be disliked? The issue is that Maghrib is very short. The time for Maghrib is very short. If you oversleep, you've lost Maghrib. Whereas any of the, the other prayers, you do have a lengthy period after that. After Zuhur, you have Asr is of full length, etc. So this was to prevent, that's one obvious meaning, to prevent the uh, possibility of missing your mother and all together. If you could read the question out loud for them. Is that okay? The question is asking about, could you please advise today's youth on the excessive use of WhatsApp? Because their day starts with using the app and used will they fall asleep in bed while using it. So let's generalize instead of WhatsApp so we don't get sued by WhatsApp. We generalize it to social media in general. Okay? Social media and the research that is done now about how much time people spend on it to get their social needs and how it affects their social life outside of the digital life. Okay? There's been now, now that there is about one over one billion using it, so the phenomena is studied extensively. And I'm speaking personally, I was one of the first people who used Facebook when it first came out, because it was only available to university. In fact, my ID is just number 28,000, talking out of a billion. So from the beginning, I wanted to use it for the da'wah, and alhamdulillah, it was, it was a niche at that time for people to come and ask questions on it. But subhanAllah, I found that it's taking away from the time that I'm doing other things. And then I started to measure it objectively to limit myself to a certain number of minutes a day. But today when you read the research, and some people who have spent about three to four hours and they've even measured how many times when someone posts something, how many times they click refresh to see how many people like that. You know, and, and then their self-esteem is connected to how many people like that. So sometimes you post something and, and only one person like it and then you see it was seen by 120 of your friends but only one person liked it, the person starts to feel depressed. <laughs> That's the reality. Other than people who always post good things about themselves, you are opening the door of hazard for everyone to do that to you. Because normally we don't post our hardships, we post the good stuff. So as a result, the person who reads this, they think everyone else's life is good and their own life is miserable. So people, there was a connection between a correlation. The more people use social media, the less they feel happy, subhanAllah. But as Sheikh Bilal, Dr. Bilal taught us, everything is good with a balance. Also social media is good to keep what? To keep the relationship with what? Knowing the news about our relatives. Some people, I would not know what's happening in their life if they weren't on my network. And Dr. Bilal also is very active on his page as well on Facebook. Alhamdulillah, so many things we learned 
from social media as well. So the key is the balance. If you, inshallah, use a timer, some of those apps, the time, how much you, you use Facebook and limit it to, okay? Research shows it's best to use it about 28 minutes a day max. Okay? But depend, don't let it overtake your life. But that, and of course when you add WhatsApp on the other things, the same thing. WhatsApp is good for Salat Maha and you send a message to your aunt, your, your uncle, your friends, all that, okay? But not to spend the whole day on it. Okay? Just to get things done. The Zakim Allah. Okay, last question for the sister, please. We need to wind up, right? Okay, one more, one more. Okay, we give one more chance for her and uh, one more class. Then we'll wind up. Okay. My question is to the um, as you said that the, uh, the, the extremist groups like ISIS and Boko Haram, they are good, they are good signs in the sense they are evil and they are suppressing the good. But the question Muslims uh, are being asked these days are the straight questions, do you condemn them or not? And you have to say yes or no. There's, there's no chance of explaining. And then there are, there are questions like, you know, do you think that they're Muslim? Do you consider them being fellow Muslim? Uh, or do you or do you not? Questions like that. But how do you think they should be answered? Their, their, uh, their programs or their movements, the, the, the movements are evil. But it doesn't mean that they take them not Muslims. Even if they slaughter other Muslims, it doesn't mean necessarily that they're not Muslims. They may be misguided on it. You know, and there are many people there, many people who want them with sincere intentions. But not knowing really what is right and wrong in these matters, they get caught up and they end up doing things that, you know, are, are evil in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know? So on one hand, we don't say they're non-Muslims because they're doing it with these uh, group of non-Muslims. No, they're a group of Muslims. But there are Muslims who went astray in this matter. We had from the time of, of the Khulafa Rashidun, you know, the, uh, in the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib, we had the group that broke away from his uh, followers who came to be known as the Khawarij. They did the same thing. They labeled uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib and Muawiyah to be disbelievers. Their blood was halal, and they went and killed Ali, and they tried to kill Muawiyah, and they killed many other Muslims too. They were slaughtering Muslims left and right. You know, so they that methodology of labeling where, where they excommunicate Muslims. This is an evil methodology, but we don't say that they are non-Muslims. That judgment is with Allah SWT. The previous question was from the sister. So to be fair, we'll give one last question for the brothers. Yes, that'll be the last question. Okay, so the mic for Sheikh Walid. Go ahead. I want to ask, is the network marketing permissible? Network marketing. Yes. I will have to know what exactly you mean by that. I mean, it's... Uh, <laughs> it's like uh, you sell a product. And then you sell a product. Mm -hmm. And then you bring uh, partners. Under you, and then they sell uh, the, the same product, and then they bring two other partners under them. So you just. Um, Are you talking about the pyramid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The pyramid, yeah. The pyramid So you just sit home and enjoy the free income. Multi level marketing. Okay. Yes. Okay. I mean, the marketing activity itself, and yeah, you're marketing something, and then you sell it and you take a commission out of that, that in itself is permissible. But the way the pyramid scheme is set up, it's set up in a way that eventually someone is getting the vast majority of the benefit and the people who are down on the pyramid are going to lose because they're going to get a product. There will be a point in the pyramid when some people will get it and they will not be able to sell it back on the promise that they may make uh, a lot of money out of it, okay, big promises. So because of that, Wallahu a'lam, the people who 
studied this phenomenon, the specialist in Islamic finance, they said that per, the pyramid scheme is not permissible. I'll ask Dr. Bilal if he can add something about that. I can I, what you said is what I... Well, with that, we can conclude. As uh, Rasulullah said, in Manda, Yashkurun Nas, Lashkurun At this point, I would like to take this opportunity uh, to thank the, the management of Sheikh Isa Cultural Center, Sheikh Khalid bin Isa Al Khalifa, and the Discover Islam Management for giving us the opportunity to have this lecture. And most importantly, we want to thank our guest speakers. Abu Amin and Dr. Bilal Phillips and Sheikh Walid uh, Hakim for their excellent presentations and sharing with us this wonderful knowledge and enlightening us on the very important and relevant topics which will help us to become better Muslims, inshallah. May Allah reward them greatly for their efforts and their contributions and we will give them, inshallah, the highest grade in Jannah. We pray for Allah to bless them and their families and we hope that they enjoy their visit in Bahrain. We hope to see them again in this future very soon, inshallah. We want to benefit more from your visits. May Allah reward you all greatly. And we want to thank the audience for their participation and being here today with us and all the volunteers of Discover Islam for helping in organizing this program. And good night. Thank you for coming.